Hi, this is Marcel again. I'm um, entering week two. Um, we're looking at the CAPS document. We're going to be interrogating it. And I'm recording from a glorious Port Elizabeth. It's now 10, 16 minutes past two. It's the 11th of April and it's a Sunday. Um, this week, you're going to have two recordings. One is going to be canned, which is this one. And then you're going to have your face-to-face -face learning event on Thursday on Zoom, where I will be talking about the curriculum for language teaching, not the CAPS general as we're looking at it now, but specifically for FAL, this additional language and home language. So you'll have two separate um, recordings um, this week. This one, which is the same for home language and for first additional language, and then you'll have your separate Zoom ones. Um, first additional language, you're also going to have two, uh, two canned recordings next week. The first one's going to be for, um, first, uh, for second language acquisition. It's an additional um, section you have in unit one as well, which is to think about how second language students actually acquire the language to speak it more profici proficiently. So let me just share my screen with you. So to get my PowerPoint up and running, there we go. With all the branding for um, Studio, the Faculty of Education, School of Education, and this is for English methodology. Yes, this is my first slide. As you can see, I'm combining again um, first additional language and home language, SP and FET. And there's the CAPS document on the left, and we're going to look at explaining or interrogating the CAPS document where it came from, why it was there, what does it try to achieve. Um, it's quite important for the schools, especially the government schools, because it's the cornerstone of all teaching, um, assessment, um, content, all goes back to the CAPS document. So you really have to know a lot about it. For those of you that have missed my welcome and um, opening introduction video, I am Dr. Marcel Heron again, hi. Um, you always can get hold of me at uh, marcelh at studio.ac.za. I've already met quite a few of my students. Nadia comes to mind at this point, Franco. Um, we've had little issues. Um, I do try and email back as soon as I can. So if you're unsure about anything and needing me to just do iterate something or explain something, it's no problem. I also work on weekends, um, not always, but um, if it comes through and I see it on my phone, I will respond to it. Yes, and as I said, learning is fun. Teaching English is fun. Um, if it's not fun, uh, your students are not going to really enjoy being in the English class. They should look forward to it because it is a good thing. It takes down the effects of fault. So if they're not anxious and they're happy and motivated about learning a language, they will do well in English. Right, so let's just look at the task roundup, what I've had for you for week one. Um, you had the mentee, um, how are you feeling survey, and that closes now, and I'll give you the results from it. You also have the welcome and introduction quiz, which is a commute quiz that will close on Friday the 16th. So you've got until then to complete. Um, I'm gonna give you the results from 121 of you that have already done it. Um, thank you, I looked at those yesterday. You also have from week one lectures, you've got to do your reflection task where I've asked you to tell me something about yourself as I have as well, and you're learning more about me all the time. Um, and I've asked you to put in an image or a picture. I've had a few queries that it seems like sometimes the image is not being uploaded. I'm not too sure how that works. Please just um, insert your image or your picture on the actual document, not two documents, one document, and then just upload it like that. Also said that um, for those of you doing FET and um, um, SP, you can submit the same one. This is just your participation mark. Uh, so it will be similar, similar um, the two course, for the two courses. So just upload it, um, it will add towards the 10% of your mark as well. Um, then you've also got a mind map to do. Um, there was a bit of queries about this as well. Remember for the FET, it's about your reading strengths and challenges for reading. Okay, not writing, reading if you the FET. So there'll be two separate different ones if you do both of those courses. And then writing for SB, your challenges and your strengths as a writer. Just five things, you don't have to write a whole book about it. Just 
beautiful mind map you use in Poplet or mind map or any other software that you choose to use to create the mind map and then just upload it on ECR. We don't really send anything on email because Everything must happen on the learning management system. It must happen on ECI. I mark things there. I access them. If it comes to my email, it gets lost on the side. It's not linked to the learning management system. So everything must happen. So it can be recorded, graded, or on the system. Then week two, which is now coming up, you're going to have an online tracking quiz on ECI. It's going to be a multiple choice, very much like the Kahoot, uh, related to the lecture content. This will only be uploaded on Thursday evening or Friday morning. It's based on Thursday's lecture, not this lecture. So I'll only upload it then. Whereas the CAPS Activity 1, which is also going to help you with Assessment 1, your assignment, is going to be related to the CAPS document. And so you can start working on that already. So it will be sort of related to this. Then I'm also going to do a textbook survey to see how many of you have actually got Ferreira. Okay, because I've had some students who's let me know that they still not, they do not have the textbook. Um, I think Wise Books has not ordered enough with the millions of you. And so they're waiting for it. Hopefully that will come through quickly. Just to let you know that if there is an issue, um, especially as some of the, the readings for the assignment one do come from Ferreira, I will scan them and upload them on ECI so that you will not be um, disadvantaged if you don't have the textbook. And then just a very small case study also from Ferreira, just to think about the Bix and Kelp. This is also related to my lecture on Thursday. Right. Right, so as a spreadsheet, I also indicated this in my, my welcome um, video. I do monitor the different online tracking tasks you have and I share it with you. You'll see that I'm going to give you both the FET and the FEL spreadsheet here now. This is the FEL, um, this additional language. There are 66 FETs I'm registered at the moment and four have submitted their reflection. That's not a problem because you've got until Friday the 16th, I think, to complete it. There is a due date for it. It will close if you don't submit. If you don't really care about the 1%, it's okay, don't submit it. Remember, you can do the same submission for both FET and SP. For SP, there are 50, 156 of you and 14 of you have actually done the reflection. You can see it's still in red. The red means not many have done it. And with the result, there shouldn't be a smiley face, it's more a sad face. Okay, so I'm sure when I put the spreadsheet up next week, when you've all submitted, it'll be full mark, 66 and 156. For the home language group, um, there's 70 of you that are FETs and 12 of you have submitted your reflection. For the SPs, 125 of you and 28 have submitted. It's still red because with the total numbers, it's really a minority of you that have done the reflection. I'm sure the numbers will increase day by day. And so not really happy face, more um, perturbed face. Okay. Right, your mentee, um, how are you feeling uh, survey. I went and looked at the results. It's closed now, and I'm going to give you a bit of an, of an overview of what was said. This was last year's in February when we started and how my students felt. The first one was only three of them. And you can see the overwhelming feeling was excited, which is quite positive. But there were quite a few negative words like confused, apprehensive, overwhelmed, uncertain, although there was some expectant and nervous. Those words will be repeated all the time. But a bit later on, um, it became increasingly negative. So the excitement seemed to drop a bit and uncertainty prevailed and nervousness and um, caution and confusion. A few were a bit happy, some were drained, um, so quite negative. Let's just see how the, the um, first additional language um, and SP and FET, 35 of you completed this. And the overwhelming word seems to be excited and happy, which I'm quite glad about, but there is quite a lot of nervousness and anxiety, overwhelmed, confusion, um, uncertain, scared. But there are things like open-minded, open um, hopeful, enthusiastic, but we still all have our retired and exhausted students as well. Oh, well, there's an optimis optimistic, but still a small number. And glamorous. Okay, that's interesting. And as far as the 
home language. Again, uh, overwhelming excitement, which I'm glad about, um, and some happy, but also again, we've got a lot of nervousness, anxiety, uh, students who are overwhelmed and stressed, um, cautious, concerned, disorganized, apprehensive. But hopefully as time progresses, all the negativity will might be maybe done away with and we will sail on in the positive excitement of teaching English, <laughs> I hope. Okay. Right, this is the Kahoot Challenge. As I said, I'm, this is just a peep in. 121 of you have already completed it as I saw it, on, yes, I saw it yesterday. Um, it ends on the 16th, which is Friday night. And next week, I'll give you an overview. They do quite a nice little presentation of the top or the pops, the top three. Uh, that makes me happy. And at this point, the top 10 are these people. This will change because I think they look at timing and accuracy and so on. So CCB, whoever you are, well done. You're the top of the pops. Um, and I've got a 713 student number. I see this number appearing all the time. Um, thank you for that. You're number two. And there you go, Mahara, Chepo, Lish, Shelby, Nick, Danny, CGL, and Tan. You're the top 10 so far. So you can say from Saturday, you guys were the top 10. Well done. Again, just looking at the um, books that you need, you need the CAPS document. You need to have the clean document as well as the Ferrero document. So there they are. These are going to help you with the interrogating caps part of unit one. Um, this will really help you as well. Um, not only for English, but it's very generic as for all your subjects. So if you've got a specialization for LO or anything else, this book will also help you because it's not strictly English, but it is a more generic discussion of teaching and grading and rubrics and so on. So I can really recommend it. Um, it's 2015, so it's more up to date. But um, Ferrero is great for pedagogy and the teaching of English. I'm also going to do a survey for you about your textbook. Um, I'll start this next week on Monday. I'll put the survey in for you to, to complete. You also only have two days to complete it. Last year, I did the same thing. And you can see at the start of the year, 67% of my students didn't have a textbook, whereas 33% did. So there was a problem there. This increased to 53, not having it, to 47% having it. And again, it seemed to be like a 50-50% um, with no and yes. I'm hoping that with you, there's going to be a reversal with most of you saying yes and fewer saying no. Please, this, I'm going to be referring to this all the time. You'll see that in my lecture notes and your page references. So it is actively used in all my lectures. Okay, so I said learning is fun. English teaching is fun. English teachers are fun. But um, there's someone else who's also got another take on learning and education, which is Nelson Mandela, who gives us a magical side to what education and learning can do. He says, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. So look how magical and how powerful learning is and education is that you can actually change this world because of it. And I'm going to challenge you as English teachers to change the world. Let's change this world. Let's make it a, a world where students are communicative, who are achieving, who are critical, who can collaborate, can be creative. And if you think about the four C's of um, the 21st century education we'll be going into, the importance of being critical. And critical appears all the time in the CAPS document. Critical about how you reason and how you think, how you find solutions to problems, that you are creative, you're thinking out the box. And this is one of Bloom's taxonomy, highest um, cognitive levels. The world needs more creative people. Collaboration to work with others, teamwork, group work. Please, students don't sit by themselves anymore. They, they work in teams. They listen to other people's ideas. And they can communicate to convey those ideas. There's no such thing as silence in the classroom anymore. People need to talk. Teachers are facilitators. Encourage your students to collaborate, to be creative, to be critical, to give opinions. Not only yes. Why yes, no, why no? So to encourage this kind of critical thought and how we can solve problems. This is the new world we're going into. 
So today's lecture is the interrogation of the CAPS document. Um, we can look at, I think it's about 11 points. Sounds a lot, doesn't it? But where we were with um, our education before 1994, where the national curriculum statement came in, the NCS, what the rationale was for it, what the task team were required to do, what they investigated, what their findings and recommendations were for the schools, what the implementation plan is for CAPS, the progress, the challenges of CAPS, and the future of CAPS. So we'll try and cover all of these in today's lecture and then finish off with CAPS task one, which also will help you with assignment one. So let's go before 1994. I think some of you weren't even born <laughs> at that stage, you generation of the 2000s coming through. Um, this was our world before 1994, before our first democratic election what was the state of education in South Africa. So if you look before 1994, we had a racially differentiated system of education with 13 different departments, which were fragmented. They didn't actually work together at all, which were arranged along racial lines, unequal treatment of funding, unequal outputs. And we had a department of education for the whites, for the Indians, for the coloreds, for the blacks, all totally different, not in unison um, with the unequal outputs resulting with maybe for the whole bunch of education, the problem with low um, pass rates. And I think our students are still emerging out of this whole bunch of education which happened from 1943. So from 1994, post-democratic election to 1999, it was a period of restructuring and reorganizing the education system in South Africa. And the whole idea was to reform policy and de-racialize the schools. Um, I don't know if you remember, there were no whites could go to a black school, no blacks could come to a white school. Um, we had all the segregation with apartheid, um, which I think many of our students have got no concept of what it was actually like during that time. And then also to develop a new curriculum to replace the whole ideology from apartheid that um, Afrikaans could only do this or English could only do that or black schools could only do this, that we could actually have one core curriculum and then have new funding norms so that um, there was equal distribution of resources and allocations to try and make the outputs more equal across the different schools. So this is a typical picture taken before 1994, what the schooling system would look like, no desks, um, students crowded into a shanty tin, um, teachers not having proper equipment, um, this is still later on, but you can see how massive the classes are sharing desks, although these two students have all got um, uniforms on. But the problems of mass classes with COVID, you just can't have that anymore. Moving on to the more racially um, integrated schooling systems where it doesn't matter what your race is, you can go to any school that you choose to go to and you can work together in a different way. You can see encouraging group work talking together, smaller classes, hopefully. And here we go, technology coming into the classroom, bringing in computers, laptops, tablets, um, cell phones, um, the whole change. But I think if you think about these pictures, you can see maybe some of our schools are still stuck pre-1994 in terrible conditions. Um, with no electricity, no sanitation, no water. I think COVID brought that to the fore as well on how disadvantaged many of our schools are. If you look at the funding model here, you can see that there are quintile um, levels. The one, two, and three are the poorest of the poor schools. And you can see that from, they used to get about 700 Rand per student, um, but you can see they increased the amounts from 2016 to 2018. They get about 1,313 Rand per student. And these are schools where they don't have to pay school fees. They are our poorest, poorest schools, whereas the fours and fives are our X model C schools, our more integrated urban schools where they, the school governing bodies determine the policies. Um, students have to pay school fees. They have more teachers because there's money to pay for more teachers. And you can see the government doesn't give them very much the the quintile four um, schools will get 658 per student, 
whereas the, the sort of the more very, very rich um, government schools will only get 227 rand per student, but the rest comes from school fees in the school. So you can see the different challenges that face these schools that just don't have students that can pay for their learning and how disadvantaged they are. Right, these are the different quintile schools. If you look at the different colors, the blue is the one going all the way to the quintile five on the right. So when they enter the schools, all students seem to be on the same level. When they enter the schools in grade one, they're all achieving the same thing. They're on track, they're doing well. There's a big issue that happens in grade four, it just breaks down totally after the, the foundation phase. I mean, you can see it's only the quintile five schools that are still achieving. The breakdown has already happened. Um, and then slowly the quintile one, two and three, they just go right down to the four. They just go below what they should be doing until those entering the grade 12 to the bachelor pass are mostly coming from the quintile five schools and very few from the one, two, three and four schools. So you can see, despite the funding differences, there are still many, many challenges facing these different schooling systems. Right, so number two is the National Curriculum Statement, the NCS. So what were they proposing to do? The apartheid school curriculum was narrow, out of date, Eurocentric, little focus on South Africa and Africa. Um, content was just not relevant to our country and totally not relevant to the time. So the whole curriculum revision had to take place, decolonize the content, make it more Africa, um, more South Africa, check what we were teaching the students, and also focus on the creation of knowledge, not just regurgitation and memorization and rote learning of, of the way we applied our learning, but that students learn to create their own knowledge they're taught how to think and how to apply what they learned rather than just to paraphrase it all back to the teachers. And also to focus on these 21st century skills, which are global skills our students need. And they need these skills to participate in this type of society. Again, the four C's is to communicate well, proficiently in whatever language you're using, to, to be able to work in teams, to collaborate, to create again, so important to think out the box and to think critically about everything. They must have opinions and support why they are saying things with reasons. So to be encouraged to do that school. If they're told to keep quiet all the time, our students will never learn how to think critically and how to collaborate. So the new um, NCS curriculum was internationally, actually internationally benchmarked, um, not just South Africa, it wasn't a local curriculum so that our learners could participate actively, yeah, and contribute to our democratic South Africa society, as well as the global community. So it wasn't a very narrow curriculum, it was to encourage our students to be able to be world players and global players. So the rationale behind the CAPS document was that the school challenges would be met, the current at the point of 1994, how would this, the CAPS document, meet those challenges. So what about the teacher overload and the administrative burdens that they were facing? What about their lack of clarity on what to teach and how to assess it? What about the learner underperformance in international and local assessments? I'm thinking about the polls. I will speak about this later on when I come to reading. Polls is the um, progressive, let me get this right now. It's the um, progress in reading literacy study. So how do they progress in reading across the world? South Africa performs the worst. And then the, the ANA in grade nine, it's the annual national assessment to see how our learners are performing. I think it's maths, English and home language what they test. And there was a minister then appointed, um, minister appointed the task team to review how it was being implemented in July of 2009. Okay, and there's your CAPS document, that's what it looks like. So the CAPS team went and tried to identify what challenges we've been experiencing, what pressure points there were for the implementation of from grade R to grade 12, 
They've investigated how they could address these challenges, what were the interventions they could practically implement to these challenges. And so they investigated key areas. Um, first of all, curriculum policy and the guideline documents, they investigated that. The transition from foundation to intermediate to senior phase to FET phase, as well as the grades. How did, the, how did assessment work, especially school-based assessment, the more formative, which the schools actually set? Looking at learning support materials, the textbooks, what were being used in the schools? And what about training and support for teachers? So these are the key areas that were investigated by the task teams. And I've got, I think, four main findings and the recommendations that they came up with. So the first was to do policies. Um, there were too many. Just imagine there are 13 fragmented departments, four different departments based on racial lines. So there are too many guidelines and policies with discrepancies and repetitions, not a working document. And this complicated planning put administrative burdens on teachers without contributing to learner attainment. So even with all of this, students weren't achieving. So the recommendation was to have one curriculum um, policy statement for every subject by phase so that every single subject would have their own policy statement one, okay? This would streamline and clarify the policies, hopefully reduce the teacher's workload and the administrative requirements and planning. I don't know if this is happening. Allow more time for teaching. And one teacher said to me, she wants all her assessments done for writing done by April. She doesn't want to mark anything more after that. So does this really allow more time for teaching? Makes you wonder. And then the CAPS, use the CAPS document to show how you can sequence, how you can pace, and hopefully making your planning easier as a teacher, not more complicated. The second one was teacher development, because obviously teachers needed to be able to work with the new curriculum. Um, they might have been reluctant and not wanting to change from the old systems. So current teacher development policies were put in place to support the curriculum, um, which were not generic and superficial. So they tried to give them as teachers a policy that was not too generic one size fits all, right? So if I'm teaching science, I have the same curriculum for English. I mean, that does that actually go together? And that all newly trained teachers were often not competent to teach this curriculum. So why do you think I'm introducing this to you? So that obviously as teachers going out from PGCE, you are competent to teach using the CAPS document. So the recommendation was to train the teachers to support the curriculum implementation um, which is subject specific and targeted. So to train the teachers to actually use this document. And interestingly, that all support staff, right from school management to subject advisors to district officers should also undergo CAPS training. So they knew exactly what CAPS was all about. What about assessment? That's so important as students exit the system, the learners exit, and you can see discrepancies in attainment. Um, how are we going to deal with this? And this is especially true for the GET, the general education training grades seven to nine. They needed a new assessment policy because this was never developed to support the NCS. So they had to have their own new GET policy for assessment. As a result, teachers and parents were often confused about what to assess, how to assess, when to assess, what should we assess. Recommendation was to simplify, streamline all the requirements and so improve the quality and status of the assessment by making the GET and EPT phases consistent on how you'll see they are different but very consistent in the structure of how they are applied. To have our national systemic assessments at grades three and grade six to conduct the regular national assessments to see how all the grade three is progressing before they go into the intermediate phase and how all our grade six before they enter in the GET or the they go into the senior phase. Replacing the CTAs or the common task assessments with 
annual national assessments for all grade nine learners with maths, home language, and English. So, so common tasks, which the teachers said we're going to be replaced now with national assessments in grade nine, which is quite important for them. And this also sets a benchmark, I think, for teachers to see how they should be assessing their students. It helps to train, I think, as well. This is quite an interesting graph. Um, if you look at the literacy levels in South Africa, remember if you go in from, from foundation to intermediate in grade four, what, are you, what is your literacy like? Um, how many students are illiterate at this point and how many cannot even read for meaning? If they're going from, they should be able to read after grade three and they should be able to read for learning by grade four. All right, so if you have a look at the purple, 83% of the students cannot read for meaning, and we've got 50% of them are illiterate. That means they can't read at all. So how will they be able to read to learn in grade four? If you look at the Eastern Cape, where I come from, also notorious for poor results, 60% of the students cannot read for meaning, and 32% are illiterate. And I've been in schools as well, where teachers can do nothing with the grade grade eights and grade nines because they still cannot read even in these standards, in these grades. And there's the Western Cape, which always achieves the best, even with the pearls and the annas. They, they've got the education system, I think, really working well. And um, they make sure that these schools are operating well. And 27% over there cannot read for meaning. 11% are illiterate. In South Africa, of the whole country, 56% of our students, 58% of students cannot read for meaning, 29% are illiterate, which means that only 13% of our students are literate um, in grade four. And this is quite an indictment on our education system and how important it is for our foundation phase teachers to, to bring that level up. So the final finding with task force came across was there were too many subjects to subjects. So in the intermediate phase, too many subjects for our learners, uh, where learners had to shift from three learning assessments in grade three only to nine in grade four. So it's a huge jump for them. Also, they were supposed to start their first additional language in English in grade one and it's often only happened in grade three. So English as a subject was only introduced in grade three. So students were not having their second language, English or other language in grade one. So these were problems. So the, the recommendation was to reduce the number of learning assessments in the intermediate phase to six, not nine. And it would be four subjects, including the two languages. So a lot easier. And then to introduce English file in grade one. Okay. So how has the CAPS implementation plan gone? So 2011, preparation for the CAPS introduction. 2012, it was grades three or, or grade R to three and grade 10. 2013, grades four to nine and grades 11. And by 2014, six years ago, grade 12 as well were part of the CAPS plan. How has it progressed? Well, there is one curriculum and assessment policy now for every subject from grade R to grade 12. So the, this has been developed. CAPS does indicate the sequencing of content, the pace that you should go at, the content you should be teaching and how you should assess. So it's all there with lots of examples. It's jam packed with information. There's also a specific training for teachers. They get 40 hours training per year to help them with the implementation of the CAPS curriculum. So they're not left standing alone. So what are the new emerging challenges in spite of all the positivity and what CAPS can do, what challenges remain? Yes, there's still content overload and the amount of curriculum to be covered is still a burden for many of our teachers if you go and speak to them. The quality of formal assessments is still very, very poor. And we'll look at some statistics about that. So what they are setting as tests are still problematic. There's very little understanding of the um, cognitive levels. CAP speaks about the higher order cognitive levels. I'm just gonna use Bloom's as an example, that you go from, way from 
understanding and remembering, which is the lowest cognitive level. So when you ask all your questions that are regurgitation of facts, um, that is only understanding and remembering is very low in terms of difficulty levels or complex cognitive levels. The applying, you're moving up the ladder to analyze, to evaluate, to create. So teachers don't seem to know about the cognitive levels or apply them. We'll be looking at this in our assessments and um, you will have to be cognizant of them. The different types of assessments um, that are put into the CAPS document, they don't understand how they are actually put together. How is the grammar paper put together? What are the sections we should have it? How does it come together? What about the weighting of the assessment and what about the time and the marks? Does what they're actually asking relate to the time it takes and actual mark allocation? That for one mark they ask for 10 things or for 10 marks they ask for one thing. So it's this whole imbalance that actually happens. The accommodation they need to make and concessions, which, are, which is a principle of CAPS, how do you accommodate students that aren't reading properly? How do you accommodate and make concessions for students already battling to write? How are these addressed in the classroom? The teachers move away from teaching for assessment, right? Which is what they're doing, right? Not how to master the content, um, that they're teaching how to pass the exam or the honors or the polls. The reading levels of our teach of our learners, as we've gone through that now, you've seen from the polls, which are going to in depth later on, our reading levels are really problematic with many of our students illiterate and not able to use their language to learn. And the importance of our 21st century skills, the collaboration, creativity, the um, C's or the C's, uh, communication, um, that they need all those skills as well. There they are. Thank you for helping me. Google. Go. Communication, there it is, the C, sharing your thoughts and ideas, group work is so important, collaboration, working together, putting your talents and expertise together, um, your critical thinking, looking for problems, how we can solve them, how we can learn across disciplines, and what about creativity, trying new approaches, teachers also need to do this, um, use group work, don't be worried if they make a noise, try different things. Um, be innovation, be innovative, um, use invention. And these are not just what you need, they are much needed for skills within the world today, globally. So assessment quality, here we go. This is look at teachers, how qualified they are to set assessments. That's why we were doing quite a few setting of things to, um, in terms of our assignments, especially when we go into um, semester two, we're gonna be designing exams, we're looking how we actually set an exam, which is not gonna be copied from the internet. Right, so if you look at the first column, um, the first column the, on the bar graph is below basic, the, the dark gray one is basic and then it's required. So for assessment literacy of our teachers, 52% of them, are, this is a 2014 study, are below the basic levels of understanding how to set assessments. For 48% that only have basic, understanding of how to set assessments and then zero for what is required. If you look at the summative assessments, those are your year end type assessments, 19% of them are below average, below basic, 71% of them are at basic and only 10% meet the requirements of summative assessments. Let's look at the last formative assessments, which remember we spoke a bit in my introduction week one, how important formative is, it's not just the end, they can improve. Well, for formative, those little assessments to monitor and see how students are doing, 95% of our teachers are below basic. Only 5% are basic and zero are required for what is required in assessment. So these were looking at many teachers across the board and this is what the study found. Um, it's quite disconcerting. Training is needed here as well. Okay, this is all grade three students should be able to read by the time they emerge from grade three. And in grade four, they should be able to read to learn. Let's see what happens here. The red section shows the percentage of children that are completely illiterate in grade four. They cannot read in any language. So in, if you are a Sepedi's child, 57% of 
students or learners in grade four cannot read in any language. Um, Jubenda, 53%. This is quite high percentages. Um, even in English and Afrikaans, in grade four, 10% of our students cannot read in any language and the same with the Afrikaans students. Although, although the percentages are higher for those that can. In South Africa, in grade four, 29% of our students cannot read. And that is quite serious. You have to get that reading level up. This is another positive of the CAPS document and the task team um, to try and deal with assessment overload. And this is in home language, first additional language, mathematics and life skills in grade one, two and three. You can see prior to this, um, they had in grade one, I have a little error here, yes. They had 22 in grade two, 24 in grade two, 29 assessments, which is quite a lot for these little learners to go through. You can just see the numbers in mathematics, seven in grade one, eight in grade two, and 10 in grade three. This was changed to, in 2017, you can see they've got four in each of those to a maximum of 16. So for home language, first additional language, mathematics and life skills was four per grade. So they worked on this number of assessments. What about the plans to deal with the curriculum and assessment overload? So although we have got the CAPS document and what's going to deal with this, there is still a terrible burden and overload on our teachers. I'm sure you will experience that in the schools, those of you that are already there. And for those of you going into the schools next semester, when you have to do your um, TP, you must probably find that the teachers will speak about this. So the future plans, the long-term plans, 2020 to 2030 is to focus on all these areas. And these are the things they're going to focus on is offering history as a compulsory offering. So not just geography, but history as well become now compulsory. Um, your transition to grade four into your intermediate phase that you'll have subject specialization in grade three already. So when you transition to grade four, you've already got your selected subjects. You, they can include chemistry and physics as two additional subjects. You can see the thinking and science and knowledge that are created there. To decolonize our languages and introduce languages like Kiswali, our indigenous knowledge systems, embrace them and other practices to decolonize what's happening in CAPS. Um, to teach and learn in your mother tongue from intermediate phase, to bring that in to help with the learning. Um, remember, if you are able to read and write in your mother tongue, the transition is quite easy to your second additional languages. Research is needed on curriculum design and development. This never ends. Research must always go on. Um, how do we deal with the multi-grade core curriculums that teachers are teaching in three different standards? Um, they've maybe got all these students in one class. What about having a multi-grade core curriculum which will deal with all these issues that burden the teachers? And also to review the number of school calendar days and compulsory teaching time. Um, I'm just thinking back to 2020 with COVID and how much Time was lost with these students. I know many students didn't go to school after March at all. How much time was lost with this? Um, even now, schools are operating on an every second day system. So the whole school here has contracted with COVID. How in generations are we going to actually deal with this? Um, what's going to happen? How are we going to make sure that our students don't lose out because of the reduced number of school days? Um, that those days off are actually becoming school days too. Uh, what about our teachers? How are they going to deal with this? So those are another issues that are still going to emerge, I'm sure. So this brings me to um, the CAPS Activity 1 task. It will be on ECR. I'll be uploading that um, today. Please refer to the, your clean text if you've got it. It's going to help you. And also look at your CAPS document. I have uploaded that along with the task. So you can actually have your tech caps document with you. Work through the activity because that's going to actually help you with your assessment one. Okay. I hope this made some sense. Um, this is giving you a bit of a basic outline of where caps comes from, why it's around, or what it intends to do, 
And then on during our Zoom session on Thursday, I'll be going more in depth into the language side and um, how we can deal with that before we have looked at reading and assessment as well here. This is the CAPS document structure. This is in your note as well that I will be uploading. It gives you the four sections that are dealt with in the CAPS document. You've got a lovely introductory section, which I think you are actually going to be dealing with that in activity one. Then there is the subject section, which is section two. Then there is section three, which tells you about specific content sections. And section four is all about the different assessment types. So these are the four basic sections in your CAPS document. Um, so we've tried to explain CAPS. Um, this is the first page. You can see section one, introduction to the curriculum and assessment policy statement, then introduction or introducing the languages, which is section two. So it's all there for you to overview. Okay. Right. So that's me. That's thank you for listening to me. We're going to the next level. We're going to the curriculum for English on Thursday. Um, please mail me if anything's not you're not sure about anything. Um, anything. It doesn't really matter. And hopefully this is going to start making sense and that few of you are not feeling overwhelmed, confused, um, paranoid, and you're feeling quite contented and comfortable with what's happening. Okay, so bye for now. Enjoy your Sunday, which is today, but um, you must probably see this next week. So I hope you have a fabulous week. Bye for now.